how is capitalism compatible with your definition of good if it requires ever-increasing uses of the finite resources of the planet, where once depleted would mean our end? Well, I would say capitalism isn't compatible with my definition of good if it requires ever-increasing uses of the finite resources of the planet. But that's by no means self-evident, even though the scuttlebutt, let's say, especially among the environmentalist-oriented types, um, whom I have some sympathy for, by the way, especially with regards to ocean depletion. Um, there's a huge argument, and there has been for many, many years, between the economists and the biologists, and this is a really important thing to know. And the economists point out that human ingenuity is such that we're continually able to make more with less. And certainly, over the last, well, 500 years, that, that especially in the last 150 years, that's just absolutely evident, you know, like people say we're going to run out of energy, and I think that's absolutely preposterous. It's like, it's, it's as crazy as thinking we're going to run out of matter. I mean, we're, we're going through a bit of a bottleneck right now because, you know, the population is going to increase to about 9 billion, and then it's going to decrease. That's, that's the most reliable projections, and 9 billion isn't a lot more than we have now, and, you know, there's going to be some um, environmental disruption as a consequence of that, but I don't think there's any reason to assume at all that capitalism necessarily requires ever-increasing uses of the finite resources of the planet. It's also not obvious to what degree the resources of the planet are actually finite, because we, we can continually think up new uses for things that nobody thought had any use uh, at all. And so it depends to some degree on whether or not you're willing to bet on human imaginativeness or you're going to be a Malthusian pessimist. And I'm not saying that there aren't reasons for both. I'm just saying that it is by no means self-evident that things are getting worse. You know, like, there, I can give you an example. So, you know, in the last, in the last 15 years, the millennium goal for the UN was to have world poverty, like absolute poverty, so that's less than $1.50 a day by 50% within 15 years, and that was actually reached ahead of schedule, and we've lifted hundreds of millions of people into the middle class over the last 30 years, and so there is an increasing inequality in the West because the working class has taken the brunt of that, say, that redistribution to third world countries, but by the same token, you know, there's no starvation in the world anymore except really for reasons of misdistribution and, 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 and political purpose. And people are becoming richer and more educated all the time. And, you know, when we are waking up to our planetary responsibilities, once people stop starving to death and having to burn like dirt and, and eat, you know, substandard food that they've scraped out of the ground, they do start to turn their attention to things that might be more aesthetic. And so, look, I don't think there's any reason to be pessimistic, not fundamentally. And I guess the reason that capitalism is compatible with my definition of good, I wouldn't say that exactly. I would say that I don't see an alternative that has manifested itself that doesn't have far more negative consequences. You know, it's sort of a minimal pessimism issue. It's like, well, this is the best devil that we have. And I do believe it is, because the, the, the successful societies, by any stretch of the imagination, by virtually any um, metric, are the capitalist societies. It's certainly the case, for example, that the Soviet Union demolished far more of its natural resources to far less uh, productive consequence than the West did. There's evidence, there's suggestions that between 10 and 15 percent of the total area of the Soviet Union has been rendered more or less permanently uninhabitable. So. The question is, compared to what? All right, guys. It's late. And I've answered lots of questions. Is this at too high a level of abstraction? You mentioned that this... Uh, everything you're discussing here uh, is based on a system of money. Can one conceive of a, a system operating without money? Are, are we on? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that we're, we're talking about very concrete questions. Uh, can we think about a different social order? Yeah, I think we can think about a very different social order. Uh, getting rid of money is one part of it, which I don't think is the crucial part. Uh, the crucial part is getting rid of uh, tyranny. Uh, we happen to be living in a system which would have driven the founding fathers up the wall 
uh, and which uh, an, any Enlightenment figure like Adam Smith or someone would have found horrendous. It's a, it's a tyrannical system in which power is more and more going into the hands of totalitarian structures which are unaccountable, uh, namely private corporations. The, the, as has long been understood, these are tyrannical structures. They are like totalitarian states. They combine in the command center uh, judicial, uh, legislative, and executive powers. They're pretty much unaccountable to anyone. They're huge in scale by now. They, they, they were created for distorting markets, and they carry out extreme market distortion. Like in, they, they internalize risk. Uh, they, don't, they free participants from market discipline. And they have a million other ways of uh, undermining markets, whether one thinks markets are good or bad. Uh, in any event, these are tyrannical systems which have no right to exist any more than other tyrannical systems. And they have an extraordinary effect over life. I mean, they are the media. When we talk about the media reflecting their interests, that's uh, you know, like saying, I reflect my interests. Uh, yes, of course they do. The, uh, it's not just the media, it's the entertainment industry and you know, advertising and so on. This is all a reflection of a network of private tyrannies. They have an overwhelming effect on government. Uh, they don't like government because government has a defect. It's partially influenceable by the public whereas GE is not influenceable at all. So, the idea, so they've been trying to create for 50 years, they've been trying to create a mood of anti-politics, you know, hate the government. True, we have the government pretty much by the throat, but it's not totally. Those guys out there can still influence it. So let's get them to hate the government, in particular to hate the federal government. State governments aren't so bad. They're small enough so we can really run them totally. Federal government is fairly large, and you, know, you can't kick them around too much. Uh, that's the point behind the devolution, getting things down to the state level. Under some circumstances, it might be democratic. Under these circumstances, it's anti-democratic. You move things down to the state level, and even middle-sized businesses can tell them what to do. Uh, it's at the government national level, well, okay, maybe you know Microsoft and GE, but not small guys. Uh, so let's get power down, decision, when you, when you, when you take, say, uh, um, AFDC, any, any kind of so-called welfare system, you put it down to the state level, you're guaranteeing that it's not going to go to poor people. Because at that level, even middle-sized businesses can insist upon regressive fiscal measures and shift in the tax code and this, that, and the other thing, which will mean that the money goes to the rich. Uh, at the federal level, it's harder. You're pushing around the bigger things. So the idea is get re reduce the federal government except for the parts that work for us, like, and those increase like the Pentagon, say. So increase that one, because that works for us. But cut down the parts that work for anyone else, go down to the state level, uh, reduce them even further, put even more pr uh, decision-making into the hands of private, unaccountable power. That's the core of the system. And that's what's got to be dismantled, totally. I mean, it has no legitimacy. It comes out of the same intellectual roots as fascism and Bolshevism and ought to be dismantled the same way. Uh, where you go from there, well, you know, there one could discuss. Uh, there are lots of ways in which you could have a democratically run society. Uh, it's worth discussing and thinking about. But the existence of money, it seems to me, is a side part of it. Uh, maybe money should be part of a decent society. Maybe it shouldn't. I suspect it probably should, uh, some form of means of exchange. But it's kind of like a technical question on the side. The real question is tyranny. <laughs>